Do you recognize any of these famous baseball home run hitters? My name is Kevin Craig. Did you ever wonder how, whether you're at the ballpark or watching a baseball game on television, as soon as the baseball is hit, the announcer or the scoreboard can tell you exactly how far the ball will travel, even before it has landed. How is that done? Can you predict how far a hit baseball will travel? This presentation will answer that question for you. The engineering system investigation process is a model-based process and is the cornerstone of modern engineering practice. It can be applied to an existing physical system to better understand the behavior of the physical system or to improve its performance. But it can also be applied to a design concept that an engineer has created to solve an engineering problem. This will lead to a virtual prototype of that design concept, which the engineer can use to determine if the design concept solves the engineering problem. And this is done without cutting metal or soldering wires. The first step in the process is to create a physical model of the physical system or the design concept. This is done by using engineering judgment and making simplifying assumptions. There is a hierarchy of physical models possible from the less real, less complex, to the more real, more complex. The key is to create a physical model that captures the essential attributes of the physical system or the design concept and gives the greatest insight. Modeling is all about insight. The physical model will have variables and numerical values for those variables need to be determined. This is called parameter identification. Here we identify model parameters. Once we have a physical model, we then apply the laws of nature, Newton's laws, Maxwell's equations, to the physical model, not to the physical system or design concept, to the physical model, the result is the mathematical model the differential equations of motion. In order to predict the behavior of the physical system or design concept, we need to solve the mathematical model. This is called mathematical analysis. We do that by performing numerical simulations or by linearizing the equations of motion and doing hand analysis. The reason we choose to do both is because the combination of both approaches will give us the greatest insight. Once we predict the behavior of the physical model by solving the mathematical model, we then need to compare it to the measured performance of either our physical system or design concept. Remember, computer simulations without experimental verification are at best questionable and at worst useless. If we are evaluating the physical system, the physical system exists. We can make measurements, we can do measurement analysis. We can then compare the results of that measurement analysis to our mathematical predictions and determine, is the model adequate? Is the comparison adequate? If the answer is yes, we can use our model to better understand the behavior of the physical system or to make design changes, improve the system design, change the parameters and or the configuration or concept. If the comparison is not adequate, we need to know why. It could be because of our measurement, 
or it could be because of our model. And we need to evaluate both. But how do we compare our mathematical predictions when we are evaluating a design concept? The design concept does not exist physically. Well, then we have to use past experience and experiments or create some simple experiments to validate some questionable aspects of our physical model. Once we have done that, we then proceed by making the comparison between predictions and measured results, and then ask the question, is the comparison adequate? If the answer is yes, well then our design concept can be evaluated for its solution to the engineering problem. Design changes can be made, parameters can be changed, configurations can be changed, or well, the entire concept can be changed. If the comparison is not adequate, again, we need to know, determine why. Is it because of our measurements or is it because of our model? This then is the engineering system investigation process, and it is the cornerstone of modern engineering practice. When an engineer is confronted with an engineering problem, what gives the engineer confidence that they can solve the problem is a process. This is the process that gives the engineer that confidence. This is called the engineering problem solving process. And the steps are as follows. One, given. State briefly and concisely, in one's own words, the information given. Second, find. State the information that you have to find. Third, diagram. A drawing showing the physical situation with all quantities involved should be included. Next, basic laws. Give appropriate mathematical formulation of the basic laws, Newton's second law, Maxwell's equations, for example, that you consider necessary to solve the problem. Next, assumptions. This is by far the most important in the steps of the engineering problem solving process. Here we list the simplifying assumptions that we feel are appropriate in the problem. If we make too many simplifying assumptions, we may oversimplify the problem. Easy to solve, but again, not very effective in predicting the behavior of the system that we are modeling. If we make too few simplifying assumptions, the model of our system is more real, more complex, still can be solved numerically, but gaining insight from it may be very, very difficult. So there's a balance here from the simple less real, less complex, more easily solved model to the more real, more complex, more difficult to solve model of the physical situation. So there's a whole hierarchy of simplifying assumptions that we can make, and this is based on engineering judgment. Next, analysis. We carry through the analysis to the point where it is appropriate to substitute numerical values. We do not substitute numerical values initially, as it is difficult then to determine where any errors might appear if the answer that we come up with does not make any sense. So we don't substitute numbers until it becomes too cumbersome to carry through the analysis using mathematical symbols. Again, judgment is key here. When we substitute in numbers, we substitute numerical values using a consistent set of units to obtain a numerical answer. And it's very important that significant figures in the answer should be consistent with the given data.
using a consistent set of units is very important. Next, we check our answer and the assumptions that we made in the solution to make sure they are reasonable. We estimate the answer. We check the units if appropriate. Lastly, we label the answer, underline it or enclose it in a box. And with our answer, we must include the simplifying assumptions that we made in arriving at that answer, because our answer will be evaluated based on these simplifying assumptions. This whole process is iterative in nature. We may need to relax some simplifying assumptions to make our answer more realistic, more useful. This is the process engineers must follow to solve an engineering problem. We started our discussion by asking the question, how far does a hit baseball travel? In order to answer that question, we must know when a ball is traveling through air, what forces does it feel? Well, there are three forces, the force of gravity, the ball's weight, and two aerodynamic forces, the drag force and the lift force. Once we evaluate these three forces, using the initial conditions, initial velocity of the ball, an initial launch angle, and spin rate of the ball, we can then predict how far the ball will travel under the influence of these three forces. Here are some observations about balls and air. Air resistance slows a ball down. The faster a ball moves, the quicker it slows. The drag force on a ball moving through the air is proportional to the ball's speed squared. Some balls have textured surfaces to affect the air. Golf balls have dimples, baseballs have stitches and spinning balls curve in flight. Everyone has witnessed soccer balls curve into the net, golf balls hook and slice, and a pitcher throwing a baseball makes the ball dance as it moves past the hitter over home plate. These are the three forces acting on a baseball. We start with the force of gravity. This is the ball's weight. It's downward in the negative vertical direction, here shown in the J hat or negative Y direction, and it's equal to the mass of the ball, which is a constant, times the acceleration due to gravity at the particular location where the ball is hit. The aerodynamic forces, the Magnus force, which is the lift force and the drag force have the same form. They are proportional to pi, the radius of the ball squared, the density of the air in which the ball is moving, and the velocity squared, the magnitude of the speed of the ball squared. Each force is multiplied by its own coefficient. C sub L is the lift coefficient applied in the Magnus force calculation, and the drag coefficient, C sub D, applied in the drag force calculation. V hat shows that the drag force acts in the direction of the velocity, but in the negative direction and the Magnus force, which causes the ball to curve, acts in the direction of the cross product of the angular velocity of the ball, omega, with the linear velocity of the ball, v. This gives the direction, since these are unit vectors, this gives the direction of the Magnus, Magnus force, which is perpendicular to the velocity of the ball and gives the ball lift. Here in the diagram, we see the drag force, the force of gravity, and the Magnus force for a velocity vector as shown here, 
and for an angular velocity in the counterclockwise direction, which vectorially would give me a vector coming out of the page in what would be the z direction. So the Magnus force, the lift force, is in the direction shown. All three forces must be evaluated to accurately predict the trajectory of a baseball. Here are results of an analysis performed by Professor Alan Nathan in 2012. The initial velocity of the baseball was 112 miles per hour. The launch angle was 27 degrees, and its angular velocity, its spin rate, was 1,286 RPM. Professor Nathan then calculated three trajectories one with gravity only, which is the trajectory that you would predict using the physics you learn as a freshman or in elementary dynamics. The second trajectory shown is the trajectory with a combination of the drag force and the gravitational force. And we see here that the range is much less and the maximum height is much less. The most real of the three trajectories is the one that includes the drag force, the gravitational force, and the Magnus force. Here we see that the peak height of the trajectory is the largest of the three, and also the range how far the ball travels is farther than the trajectory, including both gravity and drag alone. So this is the most real trajectory. And it appears from this trajectory that the ball is falling out of the sky. And we notice that when outfielders catch a fly ball, they're appear to be catching a ball that is falling out of the sky. So this trajectory is consistent with observations that we make. In order to solve this problem for ourselves, we apply the engineering problem solving process. This is ball flight trajectory analysis. Step one is to state the given information. A ball of mass, M, which is equal to 0.145 kilograms, a baseball weighs five ounces, and radius, equal to 0 0.0366 meters, is hit by a batter. The ball has an initial velocity, V0, equal to 55.4 meters per second, and the launch angle is 27 degrees. Step two is to state what we want to find. We want to find the trajectory of the ball. Step three, we draw a diagram. Here is a draw diagram of the situation. The x-axis is the horizontal axis. The y-axis is the vertical axis. Gravity acts in the opposite direction to the positive y direction. The initial velocity vector is shown as v0 and the launch angle theta zero. Here is the ball traveling with a velocity vector v, radius r, mass m, angle of velocity counterclockwise, which would give a lift force, a Magnus force, perpendicular to the velocity vector in the upward direction. We note that the ball is performing planar motion. The motion is of the ball is in the xy plane. So our diagram shows the origin of the xy coordinate system with initial velocity v0 and launch angle theta zero. The ball is shown in its flight with velocity v and angular velocity omega, both vectors. Step four, basic laws. We assume that the baseball is a particle as we are only interested in its trajectory and not in its rigid body rotation. 
So the law we apply to the baseball is Newton's second law for a particle, which says that the summation of all the external forces acting on the particle is equal to the mass of the particle times the particle's absolute acceleration. That is the acceleration measured with respect to an inertial reference frame. In this situation, the surface of the Earth is an inertial reference frame. Step five, and most important, simplifying assumptions. We assume motion occurs in the vertical xy plane. The motion is coplanar. There is no motion in or out of that vertical plane. Since the trajectory occurs over a very short vertical altitude or change in height, we can assume that the acceleration due to gravity is constant. And we assume that that value is 9.81 meters per second squared. We assume that the density of air that the ball is moving through is constant with a value of 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. The fourth assumption is the, or are the initial conditions for our problem. The initial position, x0 and y0, which we assume is at the origin of our coordinate system. And we assume an initial velocity and an initial launch angle. Here I'm assuming that the initial velocity is 50 meters per second and the launch angle is 27 degrees. Notice that all my units are kilograms, meters, seconds, the SI system of units. Of course, these initial conditions can change, in particular the initial velocity and the launch angle. The dominant forces acting on the ball are the forces of gravity, drag, and lift, or the Magnus force. The gravitational force is in the negative y direction, the negative j hat direction. It's a constant, it's equal to m times g. The drag force occurs opposite to the velocity vector. v hat is the direction of the velocity of the ball at a particular instant in time. It changes at every instant of the ball's motion. And the drag force is opposite to the direction of that velocity vector. And it's proportional to the magnitude of that velocity or the speed of the ball squared. And the density of air, the cross-sectional area of the ball, pi r squared, um, is part of this expression, as is the drag coefficient, c sub d. The Magnus force, or the lift force, is also proportional to the speed of the ball, or velocity squared, and its direction is given by the cross product of the angular velocity vector, angular velocity unit vector, omega hat, crossed with the linear velocity vector, its unit vector, v hat. This gives the direction of the lift force, or the Magnus force, and it is in a direction perpendicular to the velocity vector. In this case, it's lifting the ball upwards. The lift coefficient is part of the expression, and the lift coefficient is chosen um, for the particular range of velocities and angular velocities, or spin rates, uh, that hit baseballs typically have. Um, and the same applies to the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient has been selected to represent the typical drag coefficient for the uh, motion of a base of a hit baseball. And since the ball is assumed spherical, the drag coefficient and the lift coefficient, where the lift coefficient captures both the effect of the translational velocity v and the angular velocity omega are given by these values. And these have been shown to accurately predict the trajectory of a hit baseball over its range of speeds, spin rates, 
and trajectories. Step six is the analysis. Here we draw a free body diagram of our baseball. Here I show it as it's moving through the air. The dashed line is the velocity vector, the translational velocity vector. The XY coordinate system is my planar coordinate system. Theta is the angle that the ball makes at this particular instant in time with the horizontal. And the three forces acting on the ball, the force of gravity and the two aerodynamic forces, the drag force and the magnus force or lift force are shown where it's assumed that the baseball is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. So the angle of velocity omega is counterclockwise and vectorially it would be in the z direction coming out of the page. The component of the velocity of the ball in the x direction is given by v cosine of theta. The component of the velocity in the vertical or y direction is given as v sine theta. And the magnitude of the velocity squared is given as the sum of the x component squared and the y component squared. And we need that in our expressions for the drag force and the magnus force. The angle theta is related to the components of the velocity vector by this expression. The tangent of theta is equal to the y component of the velocity divided by the x component of the velocity. If theta is plus, the ball is ascending. If theta is minus, the ball is descending. The law of motion that I'm applying is Newton's second law which says the summation of all the forces acting on the ball, and there are three, drag, lift, and weight, equals the mass of the ball times its absolute acceleration. So I've written the three expressions for the gravity force as minus mg j hat. The drag force is minus d times v squared times v hat, and d is given by the expression rho c sub d a over 2, where a is pi r squared. The lift force, or the magnus force, is given as L times v squared times the unit vector, which is the result of the cross product of omega hat and v hat. And L is rho c sub L, a divided by 2. So now I can break down my three forces into its x and y components. The drag force in the x is minus d v squared cosine theta. The drag force in the y minus d v squared sine theta. The magnus force in the x direction is minus l v squared sine theta. The magnus force in the y direction is plus l v squared cosine theta. The gravitational force has no x component. It has only the y component equal to minus mg. I break down my equation of motion into its x and y components. The x component says the summation of forces in the x direction. I have the x component of the drag force, the x component of the magnus force. There is no x component of the weight force. This equals the mass times the x component of the absolute acceleration of the ball. And the absolute acceleration is equal to the derivative with respect to time of the absolute velocity of the ball in the x direction. And the velocity is the derivative of the position with respect to time of the ball. By some forces in the y direction, I have the y component of the drag force, the y component of the magnus force, the y component of the weight force, and that equals the mass times the y component of the absolute acceleration of the ball, which is the mass times the derivative of the absolute velocity in the y direction of the ball with respect to time. And that equals the mass times the second derivative of the position of the ball in the y direction with respect to time. If I then rewrite these equations, 
the x and y components, I note that the acceleration in the x is given by this expression. Acceleration in the y is given by this expression. V squared is given by this expression shown. And I see that the equations are nonlinear. These equations cannot be solved analytically, but we have Simulink. And Simulink can solve any nonlinear equation because it solves them numerically. So let's now use Simulink to solve our equations of motion in the x and y directions to predict the trajectory of the ball for a particular launch angle and initial launch velocity. One of the rules in creating a Simulink block diagram is never to include numbers unless those numbers are part of the actual equations themselves. So we don't include parameter values in the Simulink diagram. We include variables and we assign numerical values to those variables in what is called a MATLAB M file. And that is what is shown here. The reason is that if we need to change any of these values, and these values occur in more than one place in the Simulink diagram, I only need to change the value in the M file. And it then automatically gets changed at every location in the Simulink diagram. If I did not do this, I would have to go into the Simulink diagram and change each numerical value for a particular parameter, and that will certainly lead to error. The parameters here are the radius of the ball, cross-sectional area of the ball, or the ball silhouette area, the mass of the ball, the drag coefficient, the lift coefficient, the density of air, acceleration due to gravity, the air drag proportionality constant, the air lift proportionality constant, the ball initial velocity, the initial launch angle here in degrees, the initial x component velocity, the initial y component velocity, the initial x position, and the initial y position. And note that I've used a consistent set of units, the SI system. These are the nonlinear differential equations we need to solve one for the absolute acceleration in the x direction, one for the absolute acceleration in the y direction, and then these two supplementary equations, one for the speed squared, and the other for the tangent of the launch angle theta. Here is the simulating diagram that solves these nonlinear differential equations, and the simulating diagram is fully annotated. I'm not going to describe this diagram, but what I will do is build a simpler Simulink diagram from scratch in the next slides. The diagram can then be annotated so it's more understandable for the reader. So let's build now a equivalent Simulink diagram from scratch. I start by opening up MATLAB. This is version 2020B. And my choice for the layout to start with is just the command window. It's a personal choice. You can start with other window views available to you. Before we draw the Simulink diagram in MATLAB, it's very important that you draw on paper using pencil the block diagram that represents these equations. That will give you some idea of the complexity of the diagram, of the blocks you will need to form the block diagram to solve these equations, and how the block should be laid out. If you don't do this first, and try to build the block diagram in Simulink from scratch, uh, you really will have a messy, unorganized block diagram. And it will take you much longer than if you follow the instruction or the guideline to first create a block diagram by hand and then go into Simulink and uh, create the block diagram in Simulink. 
I've done that. Um, I'm not including this in the presentation, but from that, I know what the block diagram looks like, how it should be laid out, and what blocks I need. Here I've opened up Simulink, and this is the essential blank piece of paper that I will use to on which to build my block diagram. And this is the Simulink library browser that I have open next to it. I've determined from my hand-drawn block diagram that the blocks I need to build the Simulink diagram are shown here. I've highlighted them and dragged them from the library browser to this white space. And that way I can then close the library browser and proceed to build the block diagram. I've determined that I need an integrator block, a summation block, a trigonometric function block, a divide block, a gain block, uh, a mux and a demux block. The mux block simply takes two or more scalar lines of information and combines them into a vector line of information, which then can be put into a demux block to separate out the scalar lines of information. So we use a mux and a demux block to reduce the clutter in a block diagram so we don't have a lot of lines going from top to bottom or from left to right. I need a scope block to demonstrate the time response of some signals, a constant block, uh, a block to stop the simulation when the ball, uh, the baseball hits the ground because it can't penetrate the ground and have a negative Y component. A math function block, which has an assortment of math functions, a product block, a two workspace block where I can take the results of the simulation and send them to the workspace where I can use then to create plots uh, that present information in various ways and can be manipulated and formulated for uh, presentation uh, in papers or in oral presentations. An XY graph block and then a relational operator block. These are the blocks that I've determined I need to create my block diagram. I've resized the blocks. I've increased uh, this for uh, the size of the font, so it's a little easier to read. Now I need to just start to create the block diagram. Now remember that we don't include numbers in our simulate diagram unless the numbers are part of the equation themselves. Any parameter values are entered into MATLAB through the parameter M file. And in Simulink, I use those parameter names, those variable names. And if those values are already in the MATLAB workspace, then Simulink will recognize those variables and the numerical values for those variables. To create a block diagram is quite easy. Once I have the equations, the differential equations, I solve for the highest derivative. In the previous slide, you saw that the two nonlinear differential equations were already in that format. The derivatives in the differential equations are the acceleration and velocity. Uh, the acceleration is the highest derivative. It's the second derivative of position with respect to time. And so I, create, I solve for, in each of those equations, for the highest derivative. Then, if I have one equation or 20 equations, I proceed as follows. I create a stem where I go from the highest derivative down to the variable, and I integrate the derivative. So I go from acceleration to velocity by integrating with an initial condition on velocity. I go from velocity to position by integrating the velocity with an initial condition on position. And I do that for the x direction and for the y direction create integration stems. Then the next step, the third step, is then to just do what the equations say. Here are the equations that I'm drawing a simulink diagram to represent. And 
there is no excuse for drawing an incorrect Simulink block diagram. The reason is that uh, the best way to check that the block diagram is correct is that once you've drawn it, simply write the equations, the differential equations of motion from the block diagram and compare them to the equations you started with. So while the equations may have an error, the block diagram should always represent the equations that you start with. There's no excuse for that not happening. So let's take a look at this diagram and see how I then constructed it. I start here with this, this signal line, which I would annotate, again, describe with a text line here. This is my acceleration in the x direction, which I integrate once to get velocity in the x direction. And there's an initial condition here on velocity in this block. I integrate that again with an initial condition on position, the initial condition on x, and I get the x position. I do the same thing for the y. This signal represents the acceleration in the y direction. I integrate that once to get velocity in the y direction with an initial condition on y velocity. I integrate again to get the y position with an initial condition on the y position. So now I have x and I have y, I have vx and I have vy, and this signal represents ax and this signal represents ay. Now ax is equal to the sum of these two terms times the v squared divided by m. So I first can get v squared, and I know that v squared is equal to vx squared plus vy squared. If I take Vx and I square it with this math function block, I get Vx squared. If I take Vy and I square it with this math function block, I get Vy squared. I can then add those two together, and this signal then is V squared. I multiply that by a gain block, which is simply multiplying by whatever is inside that block. I get then V squared over M. So this signal here is V squared over M. So V squared over M is going to get multiplied by these two sums, one in the one in the x acceleration, one in the y acceleration. So you can see here I feed this back, this v squared over m, and it gets multiplied by a sum. V squared over m gets fed back here, and it's going to get multiplied by a sum. What is the sum? In the x case, it's minus d cosine theta minus l sine theta. So this here I'm using a DMUX block, and so this signal represents, in this case, two scalar signals. So I come over here, and I see that the way I determine theta is by taking the angle whose tan of the arc tan of theta, a tan theta, is equal to vy over vx. So I use this divide block, and I feed vx, excuse me, vy into the top, and vx into the bottom. So this signal is then Vy over Vx. The angle whose tangent then gives me the angle theta. I take the sine of that to get the sine of theta, the cosine of that to get the cosine of theta. I multiply the sine of theta by both L and D. So in this case, I have D sine theta and L sine theta. And then cosine of theta also gets multiplied by L and D. So I have L cosine theta and D cosine theta. So I put them together to get here L sine theta and D cosine theta, and I feed that back here to the summation block. Now the both of them are minus, so I have minus D cosine theta and minus L sine theta times v squared over m, and that equals the acceleration in the x direction. Similarly, I have here in this block, I have d sine theta and l cosine theta, and they get summed together, or I just send those two signals back. I combine them into a vector signal, which comes back here, and then gets d mux separated into two scalar signals. And so what I have here then is um, minus d sine theta plus l cosine theta. And uh, 
So they get some there in this summing block. If I didn't use the MUX and DMUX blocks here, it wouldn't be um, make that much of a difference. Instead of one line here, I'd have two. Instead of one line here, I'd have two. It would make the diagram a little less cluttered. So now the acceleration in the x direction, the acceleration in the y direction, those two equations have been formed. So now if I run this simulation, the simulation will proceed in a time step by time step fashion where I can select the time step. It doesn't have to be too small. A millisecond is something that I choose by default. Uh, again, depending on the time scale of the uh, what the differential equations are representing. So if I run the simulation at a millisecond, 0 0.001 seconds, and I want to run it until what happens? Until the y coordinate is uh, less than zero. And so I take the y coordinate, which is right here, and I compare it to zero. So when the y coordinate is less, not equal to zero, because if I do that, the simulation won't start because y starts at zero. So when y is less than zero, y, this signal less than zero, which is a constant zero, then I stop the simulation. Now, where do I show the output? I can show the output by sending the output. Either any of these signals can be sent to a scope, can be sent to the workspace, can be plotted. I want the trajectory, so I want an xy graph. So I want to plot x uh, versus y. So here's x-axis, here's the y-axis. And so when I run the simulation, this plot appears. This is the trajectory for the particular initial conditions that I have in my M file. So creating a simulating diagram is quite easy if I want to check to see whether this simulating diagram is in fact correct. I would simply rewrite the equations from the simulink diagram. The simulink diagram tells me the acceleration in the x direction is the product of what? It's the product of this signal, which is 1 over m times vx squared plus vy squared, which is v squared. And it's the product of that. And the, the sum, a minus and a minus. A minus what? A minus l sine theta and a minus d cosine theta. And then the same thing here, acceleration in the y direction is the, is the sum of, because now what I have is an additional term, g. So I have the sum of minus g plus the product of what? The product of v squared over m times the sum of the output of the dmux block. And the dmux block has, has what? It has d uh, sine theta and l cosine theta. And the d sine theta is minus, and the l cosine theta is plus. And you can, you can see that here barely in the summing block. If you increase the zoom in, you'll see the pluses and minuses more clearly. So I've created now the simulating diagram correctly. How do I know that? Because I've written the equations that I started with from the diagram and I get the same equations that I started with. And this plot looks correct because I already have Professor Nathan's results for these initial conditions. So let's check this plot against um, his results. Here are the results of my simulation. The line that I showed on the previous slide is the blue line, which includes the drag force, the Magnus force, and gravity. I can eliminate any of these forces and show gravity only, or the drag and gravity forces only, by just letting the parameters d or l be zero. Uh, and that eliminates that aerodynamic force. So it's very easy to do that. Uh, I only have to let that be zero in the M file, the MATLAB M file, because again, D and L are variables in the simulink diagram and are only assigned numbers in the MATLAB M file. And this blue curve for the actual trajectory with all three aerodynamic forces matches what Professor Nathan predicted.
We know today how the distance a ball travels is determined immediately as the ball leaves the bat because we have instruments that can measure the exit velocity of the ball from the bat, the launch angle, and even the spin rate. And using a simulation as we've just constructed will then tell me almost instantaneously how far the ball will travel and it predicts the distance the ball travels quite well. So today, the distance isn't measured, it's predicted using a computer program like we've created today. Now, in 1963 at Yankee Stadium, Mickey Mantle hit a home run, and it was publicized in all the New York newspapers and probably the national newspapers. And it was the closest anybody came to actually hitting a ball out of Yankee Stadium. And the ball hit the top of the stadium. They call this the facade. And witnesses said the ball was close to its apex um, at that point. So it was very close to leaving Yankee Stadium. That point, um, the diagonal was 370 feet from home plate. And uh, that point is 118 feet above the level of the playing field. How far would this ball have traveled had it not hit the facade um, and landed on the horizontal ground? Well, let's use our program to determine that. As it's written here in the newspaper, and I'll let you can read through the details, the writer of this article estimates uh, that the speed that the ball left Mantle's bat was traveling at about 124 miles per hour, which is a high value, but certainly someone Mantle, something Mantle was very capable of generating. Uh, the launch angle was estimated to be 27 degrees. Uh, the atmospheric conditions were known at that time, and the uh, drag and lift coefficients for baseballs at uh, the speeds uh, that they traveled with the spin rates that they uh, had um, were estimated and were predict useful or accurate in predicting trajectories of baseballs. Um, and so if we put that information into our program, uh, an exit a speed of 124 miles per hour and an angle, launch angle of 27 degrees with the density of air um, at that particular day, the program that this newspaper used to predict how far Mickey Mantle's home run traveled is shown here, and it travels just a little bit over 500 feet. If we input that uh, and those initial conditions into our program, uh, what do we get? Well, here is our prediction with a launch angle of 27 degrees, an initial velocity of 124 miles per hour. Our program predicts that Mano's home run traveled about 500 feet with the values for the drag coefficient and the lift coefficient uh, shown here. And so our program accurately predicts how far Mantle's home run traveled or would have traveled had it been allowed to land and is something that can be used by anyone to predict how far a hit baseball will travel once we know the initial conditions of that trajectory, the launch angle, the velocity, and the spin rate, although the lift coefficient captures the range of spin rates for hit baseballs as it does the range of speeds uh, for hit baseballs. And so uh, creating a simulink diagram is the way we solve these nonlinear differential equations which cannot be solved analytically. And so Simulink allows us to do that and then predict uh, behavior, a very interesting phenomena uh, like we have here. Uh, I hope this uh, has shown 
uh, the solution to a very interesting problem, uh, how air uh, affects the trajectory of any moving object, and how the resulting nonlinear equations of motion can be solved with this very powerful tool called Simulink. Thank you very much for your attention.